During the following demonstration, you may see me opening camera midway. That won't have any effect because those three guys are exposed and used films that I restore back for demonstration purpose. Those are three common types of film with the most popular format. 35mm, also called 135, on the left. At the center is 110, and on the right is 120. Besides physical format, there are also different types of film, black and white, color, and slide. In general, black and white and color film are negative film that produce inverted image, meaning bright appears dark and dark appears bright on the film. During print or digitization process, the images are inverted back to normal. On the other hand, slide is positive film that produces normal images. Besides digitization by which you can make slide images printable, in the old days, slides are always purpose-driven and viewed via projection. Slide, positive film, is higher cost compared to negative film for everyday photography. Slide uses E6 process and can be developed at home as well. Slide can also be cross-processed using negative films chemical, such as C41, if you like the color of your image look a bit strange. For the purpose of this video for film photography beginner, I'm focusing on negative film. This is a 35mm film. Unexposed film is stored in the canister. When in use, the take-up spool of the camera represented by my left hand will advance and store exposed film around it after exposure takes place somewhere between the canister and the spool. When finished, the film has to rewind back to its canister before you can get it out of the camera. This is a 110 film, which is like a cartridge. Unexposed film is stored in the compartment on one side. Exposure takes place in the middle section and exposed film is advanced into the compartment on the other side. No rewind is needed. This is 120, a spool film where film and paper wrapped around a spool, making it trickier to handle as there is no protective casing. If the wrapping is loose, then light leak may happen to the film. To load 120 film, another spool is needed to which this tape will be secured. I'm going to show how to load a film into a camera using WAMs from ordinary types. Cameras with unique loading situation will not be a topic for this video because of how much they differ from the normality and even from one another like this Soviet era half frame by Bellomo and the modern day hand crank toy camera by Lomography. Still, I'm looking forward to reviewing my camera someday, especially specialty ones like these two guys that got history. I'm starting off with this manual mechanical half-frame camera as half-frame is quite a common and fun option for 35mm. The frame is vertical and half the size of a single 35mm frame. That means a 36 exposure film roll is capable of 72 images. Compared to this automatic camera that shoots regular full frame, you can see how they differ in the gut. To load the film into a manual camera, Pay attention to the sprocket and spool. Place film into film chamber. Insert the film leader into the spool for at least two holes in. Over the sprocket, make sure the perforation holes on the side of film sit on the sprocket teeth. Shoot and advance the current exposed frame to see if the film moves. Close the back cover of the camera and shoot again. Note the rewind crank and see if it turns as you advance the film. If it does, you are good to go. On an automatic camera, things are simpler. There's usually a mark indicating where to insert film leader into. Make sure a reasonable length is put in for the automatic spool to grab onto. Close the back cover and the camera will do the rest. If the camera fails to load, it will indicate with something like an E for empty. Open the back cover and adjust the film accordingly. Hmm. I got an E. Why? Well, it's better than an F, I must say. Let's see what's wrong. The film appears to be fully engaged. I guess the camera can tell that the film is a phony. Automatic cameras will automatically rewind film when finished. To have the film rewound before it's finished, look for a button like this and press it. 
automatic cameras tend to rewind film all the way back to its canister. In that case, you have two options, performing a leader extraction mission under light or an invasive rescue in the dark. You will receive a mission briefing later in this video. Now let's try loading a film into this manual mechanical regular camera. This film loading situation also applies to most single lens reflex cameras. Insert the film leader into the spool for at least two holes in. Over the sprocket, make sure the perforation holes sit on the sprocket tip. Shoot and advance the film to see if it's properly engaged by observing the rewind crank. If the rewind crank still does not turn after two or three advances, then the spool is not properly grabbing the film. Open the back cover and adjust the film accordingly. Most manual cameras, ranging from metal mechanical ones to plastic focus-free ones, have a film rewind button. Normally, it's located on the button of the camera. When done with shooting, press the rewind button, whereby unlocking the spool from advancing forward position. Now the spool can rotate backward for film retrieval. Use the rewind crank to retrieve the film. When you feel a sudden loose, it indicates that the film leader has just been withdrew from the spool. Leave the leader out if you are developing film yourself. 110 film is the most fail-safe format compared to 35mm and 120 film. It's like a cartridge that protects the film inside. This is the real old-timer 110 format camera that I'm demonstrating with. There are some modern toy film cameras that use 110 film. I never get one on hand, but I assume loading film into those cameras should be as self-explanatory as this guy here. When facing the label on the cartridge, the left compartment is where exposed film goes to. On the bottom of the compartment is a gear for advancing mechanism. The right compartment is where the unexposed film rests before it gets exposed in the middle section. In short, loading 110 film is just like a half piece of cake. I'm advancing the film to the first frame. Instead of the camera counting frames, it's the film that gives you frame count. This is how it looks like, pulling out the cartridge midway. Now it's getting to the end of the roll. 110 film doesn't require the rewind after finished. All the exposed film is in this compartment. There goes the back door. A finished 110 film would show a bit of film and backing paper in the middle section. Now I just repeat it again, the exposed film is inside left compartment. 110 cartridge is as sturdy as 35mm canister that you can handle with peace of mind. 120 film is not the most fail safe format compared to 35mm and 110 film. It's like a paper backing up film wrapping around a spool. Make sure not to loosen the wrapping when handling or you'll get light leak. This is a real old-timer 120 format camera that I'm demonstrating with. There are some modern toy film cameras that use 120 film. I have one called Hoga 120. This is a twin lens reflex camera. And for this particular model, my new unexposed film is situated about here. The film will pass the light striking film exposing chamber. I couldn't find the name of this part of camera. Once exposed, the film will continue onto another spool located here. Here's how the loading process looks like. This is the spool of the previous unexposed film. The film passes here for exposure and goes onto another spool here. I take out this destination spool which exposed film wraps around for development. Now I'm about to repeat history. Watch me. Keep finger crossed. Make sure wrapping not loose. Oh, wait. I need all fingers operational. No, no, no. Don't, don't keep finger crossed. It doesn't make any sense. Secure the tab onto the destination spool. Examine the result. Good. Close the back cover and it's ready to go. This film is just as worthy as me. It's not at the first frame, like 110 film. It's the film doing the frame count instead of the camera. Some 120 cameras can take other formats of film 
or offer different frame size mode on the same format. For example, this old timer here takes 120 and 127 film, while my Hoga 120 offers two frame size modes, 6x6 and 6x4.5 on 120 film. This is how advancing film looks like with the back cover open. All sorts of numbers and markings are for 120 compatible cameras that support adjustable frame size. I just repeated myself about advancing film again. It's now closing in to the end of the film. I'll open up the back cover to let you see what's going on inside at the last moment of the roll. Uh, here I go again. Now I'm at the end of the film. I'll close the back cover to better simulate a real unloading experience. When nothing is in the frame count window, it means that the film has completely departed from its original spool. I then open and see that the film is totally on the destination spool. Carefully get the film out and make sure the wrapping doesn't get loose. Use the tape or a tap to hold everything tight. Unlike 35mm and 110, 120 film doesn't have a protective casing, so handle with care. The process of loading 110 and 120 film onto reel starts right inside a dark bag. So let's pull those two guys out of the way for now. As for 35mm, if the film leader is inside the canister, there are a few simple ways to extract it. I've been using a two flap film retriever since the beginning. Later, I also have a couple of variations that shares the same method, which works like this. I rotate the film spool the same direction as rewind till I hear a clicking sound, indicating the film leader is near the felt opening. I insert one flap on top of the film and the other flap under the film. So both flaps sandwich the film leader and by pulling out the flaps, the film leader gets dragged along and extracted out. Mission accomplished. This is not a 100% consistent type of method and there's a learning curve. Besides, each variation operates a bit differently. Taking me for example, my retrieval rate is usually 7 out of 10. For the rest 3, I have no choice but to opt for an invasive residue in the dark. Now let me demonstrate with one of my serious rolls and the latest retriever I got. I insert one flap on top of the film followed by a smaller flap under the first flap. I rotate rewind-wise till I hear a clicking sound. A clicking sound. Then I insert the other flap between the two flaps while holding the spool still. Release the spool and hold on to the canister. Then pull out all flaps at once. Oh, what a success. Now my retrieval rate is 8 out of 10. There are times when the film leader just won't come out. In that case, Move inside the dark bag and open up the canister to get the film out. Can openers and pliers are practical tools to open the canister. I'm using an empty canister to demonstrate. Unfortunately, both my can opener have a rather rounded, smooth edge so they don't firmly grab onto the cap of the canister. Instead, I'm using a pliers to pull up the cap. This canister doesn't want to let go its cap. Oh crap, the spool just shut out. Anyway, I'll take this already open canister to simulate a smooth opening experience. If the film leader is out, you can preload film onto the rear under light, cut off the film leader and trim the edge to allow the film a smooth journey as it travels down the spiral passage on the rear. The balls help advance the film by propelling over the perforations on the film. Insert the film from the wider opening side, opposite to where the balls are. Once the film passes over the balls, twist the reel back and forth a little bit to see if the film moves. If it does, then the balls and the film are engaged. Congratulations! And stop here. Do not keep twisting the reel. Get your developing tank, films and reels and scissors. Put everything in your dark bag. If the film leader cannot be retrieved, Get all aforementioned items plus a can opener or a pliers and put everything in the dark bag. In this scenario, there is no preloading film. You just start off in the dark by opening the canister first, cutting off the leader, loading the film onto the reel, and twisting the reel to advance the film. 
down the spiral. When it feels like the end of the film, gently pull the canister to check if it's indeed at the end of the film. Take a scissors and cut as close to the canister as possible because you want to avoid cropping off any part of your last image. If you have already got rid of the canister as in the aforementioned scenario, then you confront a spool instead. Likewise, cut as close to the spool as you can. Better safe than sorry. To get one tank film out of its cartridge is a little bit tricky. The cartridge is composed of two housing pieces. Twist the whole thing, and the two pieces may begin to split. Use a utility knife to help split. When you get consistent gaps along the joint edges highlighted in yellow, it's time to move inside your duck bag and proceed from there. If you don't care about the housing pieces, then get your developing tank film and reel plus a scissors in the duck bag. Break up the cartridge. Once you reach the spool, don't unwrap everything at once, or film and paper will be curly and everywhere. Carefully take the spool out neat and tight. Locate the film piece. Roll it up as you unwrap the spool while separating the paper. Keep rolling till the film is entirely at your fingertips. This kind of reel doesn't have a propelling balls, so use the thumbs and do left twist, right twist to help propel the film. One twenty film is a spool film that has no protective casing. Get your developing tank, film, and reel plus a scissors in a dark bag. Unwrap the film layer, but don't unwrap everything at once, or film and paper will be curly and everywhere. Locate the film piece, roll it up as you unwrap the spool while separating the paper. Keep rolling till the film is entirely at your fingertips. The propelling balls on the reel probably won't have much effect on helping the film advance. So use the thumbs and do left twist, right twist to help propel the film. The following shows the construction of 35mm, 110 and 120 film after they are finished to give you a clear view of their physical structure, so you know what to expect working on the films in the dark. This is a Patterson Universal developing tank capable of two rows at a time. On the bottom is a data table for chemical volume requirement. I always develop two rows at a time using 500 mg, 17 ounces of chemicals. The tank's multi-format reel supports 35mm, 126, 127, 120, and 220 film. To adjust format, Reverse the left reel to unlock the axle. The outermost slot close to the opening is for 120. The center slot is for 127. The innermost slot next to the spiral is for 35mm. For 110, I use this single row tank by Yankee whose reel can take 110. The reel can also do 35mm and 120, but I use it mainly for 110. What I usually do is that I load a 110 film on the Yankee reel and a 35mm film on one of the Patterson reel. Drop them both in the Patterson tank and I can develop a 110 and a 35mm together. What's needed in the dark bag is your developing tank, films, and the scissors 
Assistance is not really needed for loading 110 and 120 in my experience. But my habit is to keep one just in case. Ready all the items as to preload 35mm film onto the reel if possible. Move all the items inside the dark bag and zip it well. Put your hands through the sleeves to operate in the bag. I just leave the cap outside the bag as the tank funnel piece itself can block light already. One little tip. In the dark bag, orient your items in such a way that they are already at the best position to accommodate your workflow. This will reduce hustle and disorientation in the dark. Here is how I usually set things up inside the bag as well as a simulation of my typical film changing process. Bathroom is the place to go for developing film at home for its easy access to running water. This is how I set up my workflow. I will mark down number on the bottle and place the chemicals in order, plus a big cup of water that's at the same temperature as the chemicals for pre-rinse and mid-rinse. A few clips are in place to hand dry films. A light stroke with sponge will help dry fast and reduce watermarks. A simple tube is helpful guiding water down to the bottom of the tank for a thorough water wash. This is how I shake my developing tank for agitation lately. This is how I dip back in college. This is when I used a tank that required me to really hold its cap in place because it just sat on top of the funnel piece without any locking mechanism. As you may notice, I'm not covering chemicals, cameras, and films in terms of brands, models, types, and specifications. As they are so diverse, it's hard to be specific. Besides, my concept of making this video is to give comprehensive and categorized general overviews that are beneficial to film photography beginners universally. Well, to be honest, I just know a bit about Codex D76, Rollis C41, and an indie film labs kit, all of which I have talked about in separate videos with a little narrative and hands-on experience. We are close to the end of this video, and I'm ending this session with two more pictures. Those are the basic tools to make chemicals. Of course, depending on personal work habit, you may like two funnels or more than one of something, and those are what you need to get exposed film into your developing tank. The point is, if you are a newcomer, with the overviews and list shopping list pictures that I put together, you'll be having fun with film developing, such a magical exercise in no time. When I picked up film photography for hobby in 2012, I didn't have any gear other than cameras and films, so I had sharp develop films and print out images for me. As I was aware that film photography might be a long-term hobby, I switched to having my film scanned so I wouldn't accumulate a bunch of physical prints over time. Later, I bought a film scan mask so that I could scan my own films without realizing that my flatbed scanner was just a regular scanner. Then I got myself a film scanner that's been in use till this day. For bigger film format like 120 that doesn't fit in the scanner, I made a photo booth where a film was to be placed between it and a lighting panel. A digital camera then picked through a hole, snapping shots of the lit film. And here is the more recent version of such method. Those are the film digitization methods that I have adopted before, except for the physical printout because that's still analog. Remember to check out my other video about chemical and developing. Then you'll get a whole listicture of basic film processing. I'm sure you'll have fun there.